Hello, it's Martin from Wisely Automotive and in this video I am checking in from the electric forecourt in Norwich and I have a very special car behind me, the Fiat 500e. Just picked it up, so have literally driven it only for a couple of miles. And even though it has been on the market for a while now, I will try to show you all the bits which are not mentioned in other reviews and give you my first impressions of how I feel about it. Speaking of that, it's a good point to mention that this 500e has nothing in common with the previous electric Fiat 500. That was pretty much a compliance car made for a couple of states in the US to meet green legislation. Whereas this is a bespoke EV. You can see that it has a blanked off grille and it's built on a bespoke EV platform. Includes CCS rapid charging up to 85 kilowatts. And the reason why I think that it's quite a unique car is that if you look closely, you may have spotted that it has a fabric roof because this is not the rigid roof version, but the convertible. Now, calling it a convertible is maybe a bit of a stretch, but the roof can fold all the way back and drop down. So you have a kind of open top feeling. I can't recall off the top of my head any other EVs which are convertible. So this is a car essentially in a category of one. The doors are nice and premium, so there is a little micro switch underneath here and that just electronically releases the door latch. On the inside, these plastics are a little bit hard and scratchy, but overall the interior actually looks quite nice, I would say. This particular example is the Icon trim, so the second highest specification. It's important to pay attention to the trim level with these because not only do you get different equipment, but also a different battery size. So the bottom trim level may seem like a fantastic deal at about 20 something thousand pounds, but you get a significantly smaller battery, definitely under 30 kilowatt hours. Whereas this is, I believe, 44 kilowatt hours gross and about 38 kilowatt hours usable. So on par with something like the 120 amp hour BMW i3. To make it even more confusing, you can add individual options on top of the trim level. So for example, in this case, the metallic paint is an optional extra and because it's the icon trim the design extends onto the top of the dashboard so that's quite nice definitely gives the car a bit more character and we've got these cloth seats they definitely feel like they will be nice and hard wearing nicely padded in fact for a small city car but if you excuse me i will jump in because even though it may look like it's the evening this ladies and gentlemen is about 2 p.m in the uk and it's five degrees outside and i'm absolutely freezing if i get my torch out you can see that there is not much space to the left of the pedals so you can't really rest your left foot on the side because it's almost touching the brake pedal and there seems to be quite a bit of space on the right side though so the pedals are quite centered i would assume that this is not the case on cars which are left-hand drive but here in the uk this is most likely a bit of a compromise solution secondly we've got push button start but you need to press the start button twice so i've got my foot on the brake i press it the first time all the displays come alive so that's good but now you see we get the prompt saying that to use the AC the vehicle needs to be fully on so I need to have the foot on the brake again and press the start button again and now the car is in the ready to drive mode so that's a bit bizarre but whatever it is what it is I picked up the car fully charged and it's now at 94 percent now keep in mind with it being cold outside five degrees I've been using the heating set to 22 but if we look at the trip computer, which is done using the directional pad on the steering wheel, I did reset all the data before I left the previous owner's house. And I've done about six miles and have averaged 2.4 miles per kilowatt hour. Not exactly a great start, but look, we have used 6% to do six miles. So about 1% per mile, which would mean that the full range from 100 to zero is 100 miles. And with the heating on, and driving at motorway speeds, which is what I've done on dual carriageways up to the electric forecourt, 
this is the range you can probably expect, at least according to the EV database website, which we find quite reliable in general. I haven't had any time to play about with the infotainment system, but let me pair up my phone and we will see how intuitive that is. So I will remove these previous devices. Perfect. And this is the thing which I wanted to show you. Even though you may assume that the 500e is kind of a low-end car, so the onboard technology will not be great, the infotainment system so far has been very, very responsive and quite intuitive, and it does support CarPlay. And if you notice, it's not just any CarPlay, but you've got wireless CarPlay. So, that is enabled. Let's see. And here we go. That's live. You can see my phone is not connected to anything. You normally only get the wireless charger on the highest La Prima trim level, but because the owner spec'd the car himself, he knew that because of the wireless CarPlay it would make sense to have the wireless charger. So I believe it's about £130 extra and he did specify it. So now I can just drop my phone onto the shelf underneath the display here. And the blue light comes on signifying that my phone is charging. Nice and easy. Arthur gave me a task to drop off something along the way, so for now I will use the CarPlay for navigation, but after that stop, let's be realistic, I'm 130 miles away from the office, so I will need a top-up charge. I will use the built-in satnav to see how that works and how it integrates with the rest of the system. Let's not waste any more time then and get going. I've got all the cameras set up. I will reset the trip computer B as well. Yep, yeah, that's already that's actually reset itself. Funny how the car thinks that the speed limit is 37 miles per hour or kilometers per hour, which is not really possible in the UK, but whatever. So, drive. The drive selector is basically just a series of buttons here at the bottom of the dash. And we go. Let's see what EVs do we have charging. E Nero, iX3, the Q4e transport back. Polestar 2, more iX3s and lots of Teslas at the superchargers. A nice mix, really. So far, I've only had the car in range mode and that's because the modes also change the way the region works. The normal modes makes the car feel as close as possible to a combustion engine vehicle, so the car will coast and only apply region once you start pressing the brake pedal. Fiat does use a blended brake system, whereas in range mode you've got proper one pedal driving, the region is applied, I believe almost down to kind of five miles per hour and then the physical brakes take over and you come to a full complete stop even on a hill. A wonderful thing is that the car remembers which mode you were in when it was switched off, so it's not like an i3 where it always defaults to comfort, but here you can leave it in range and pretty much have a car with one pedal driving. It does soften the accelerator response a little bit, but on kickdown you still have maximum power. There's a kickdown button at the very end of the travel of the accelerator pedal, so that's totally fine. You still have the power when you need it. In the meantime, I've joined the dual carriageway away from Norwich and I'm doing about 70 miles per hour as the traffic allows. And the car is not too loud. Maybe it's because my expectations were very low, especially because of the soft convertible roof. But so far, this is actually quite good. It definitely feels nimble, which is a good thing at low speeds, but you need to kind of pay attention to the steering at higher speeds. When I was going through the roundabout around Norwich, it definitely feels like the steering ratio is quite quick, which makes the car very darty. And on top of that, you've got the relatively short wheelbase. So at motorway speeds, the car can drift a tiny bit, but as long as you concentrate on driving, it's totally fine. And I believe even the base specification has the lane keeping assist. So if I touch the lane line, it nudges me back into the middle. Whereas if I indicate, the car is happy to let me go over. I know a lot of people find these systems very, very annoying, and I can agree, especially on narrow, twisty roads, they can sometimes tug on the steering wheel unnecessarily. 
but luckily Fiat, just like the Porsche Taycan, has a very simple way of turning them off and there is a button at the end of the indicator stalk and if I click that I can completely disable the lane departure warning without having to dig through the infotainment menus. I will stay in this lane and as I was slowing down all of the slowing down was done entirely by region and in fact I haven't even fully lifted my foot off the accelerator pedal. The drive mode selector is here in the middle console so if I now swap over to normal my range prediction has dropped to 127 miles and the car does feel a tiny bit eager to go with small accelerator inputs and if I let go you see now we are completely coasting. I've also noticed there is a navigation screen in the instrument cluster and I can scroll over to that but the map from CarPlay and instructions from CarPlay do not seem to carry over. But I have to be honest, all the graphics look very sharp and now that we've come to a stop, even in normal mode, I've got auto hold so I don't need to have my foot on the brake pedal. Yes, this car is quite nice and in many ways it's what the i3 was when it launched. A compact car, purpose-built for the city, but not compromised on the premium features and especially the technology. It's not quite as peppy as the i3, it's front-wheel drive. It does pick up speed when you need it to. The brakes are quite sharp, but it's difficult to tell based on the brake pedal feel where the kind of blending point is between the region braking and the friction brakes. So now as I'm slowing down, yes, you definitely need to get used to them. The pedal is a bit springy, but definitely one of the better blended brake systems and miles ahead of something like the first generation Zoe, for example. Let's see, does it grip well? Oh yeah! Unfortunately the traction control is quite aggressive, so even though I had my foot to the floor as I was exiting the roundabout, it was just not giving any power. And I'm almost at my first stop now, so I will speak to you in a second. I pulled into a local Waitrose car park because there is an issue. You know how I was saying that the infotainment system is wonderful and all of that. Well, it's struggling to connect to my phone now. I popped out of the car, I got back in the car, and it just keeps saying connecting, even though on my phone it does show as connected via both Wi-Fi for the CarPlay bit and Bluetooth. So, the question now is how do I reboot the infotainment system? You have to press and hold the on button for about 15 seconds. It's integrated into the volume roller because it has a press function as well. Okay. And CarPlay works now. Beautiful. So, we can forget that in fact. What I will do... I'll go into the device manager. And it's possibly the wireless CarPlay which creates this confusion. So. If I go into settings, I will say enable carpet and I will take that off for now. I want to use the built-in sat nav anyways. I've got 76%, so let's try InstaVault New Markets. Guys, I'm telling you, I know this may seem so obvious but this infotainment, the responsiveness of the keyboard, the way how you can just highlight text and it's so intuitive, I find it strange that nobody talks about it because this is how it should be done. This is right up there with BMW iDrive, if not better in many ways. It feels nice and snappy, excellent. It's only the point of interest search which doesn't seem to be as good as something like Tesla or anything which is powered by Google. So let me try it this way. I will just put in the postcode charging you will arrive at your destination and not and not a long route but near destination and now it found it oh. and just drive straight to there that's all good it just doesn't show me any predicted state of charge so drive and off we go i've been trying out the normal mode the car definitely feels a bit more peppy off the line and it does creep on its own, so it's not one pedal driving. 
So if you see, I've, I'm not touching the pedals and we are rolling at about four miles per hour. Whereas if I go into range mode, it just stopped on its own and applied the auto hold. So I will leave it in the range mode because that's what I prefer as an EV driver. And there is also a mode called Sherpa and that squeezes out the maximum range by turning off air conditioning and limiting the top speed. But for better or for worse, I'm not willing to do that. What I definitely want to pay attention to is that as the roads are getting wet, how is the car going to do with grip? In terms of wheels, we've got 16 inch alloys, I believe, and kind of standard looking tires. I will double check the dimensions when I get back to the showroom. But being front wheel drive, it may struggle a bit. Yeah, oh, and it's span its wheels. <laughs> And I'm leaving the roundabout. Okay, so this was quite well done. Not too shabby. Average consumption, 2.7 miles per kilowatt hour now. So that's actually improving, probably because the cabin is up to temperature. The driver says nothing interesting. I want to see the map. Yeah, so the map is good because it shows you exactly the same thing as on the main screen. So. If you want to, as a driver, you can have the map running and your passenger can be handling the music and so on. And absolutely crucial, I don't know whether you can see this on video, but we have got state of charge in percentage and in miles at the same time. Hooray, this is how it should be done. It's super simple and it's persistent. So whichever screen I go into, I can always know how I'm getting on in terms of range. VW, take notes. This is how you do it. In fact, this is how you do the entire software. And I stop. The stopping is not as smooth as something with the Tesla. I can definitely feel that the region gives up at low speed and the car transitions onto friction brakes, but it's definitely better than nothing. And I suppose once you get used to the tuning, you can get really good at predicting where you will stop. Definitely better than not having one pedal driving or auto hold. Okay. It's definitely trackable. And it does have the pep. On these country roads, as I'm driving now, 60 miles per hour, even on imperfections, the suspension is nice and soft enough, but you don't ever feel like the car is out of control. So that's nice. And unlike at low speeds where you can pretty much feel every bump in the road because of the short wheelbase, it seems to settle quite a bit. So I don't really have any complaints. There's not too much noise, even with the water on the road, it's fine. It knows about the road closure. No adaptive cruise control on this Icon version, only the La Prima gets it bundled in. And I believe you can get it as an optional pack on the lower trim levels, but no big deal. You know, this is primarily a city car and adaptive cruise doesn't always work in the city. So for this class of car, I'm not complaining that it's not standard. I will now listen to music a bit and I will catch up with you at the charging stop. I'm just leaving the construction zone, so acceleration in range mode from 40 to 70. Now! 60. And 70. Good. Speak to you then. a bit of a problem. I have arrived at the charging station as expected with 37% left. So the one to one rule is going to be good for the journey going forward. Just under 67 miles done and the average has settled at 3.1 miles per kilowatt hour. 
So considering that I was testing the acceleration pretty much out of every single roundabout, I would say that's fairly okay. The problem is that both chargers are taken. A Polestar 2 and a Cupra Born are charging. So let me try to talk to the people and see how long they will be. Obtained my food and right after I got back to the car, the charger became available. So I quickly moved over, plugged in, everything worked on the first try, no problems. Just a couple of notes before I forget. I plugged in with about 36% state of charge. If I look at the InstaVolt app, I've been charging for 22 minutes, about 20 kilowatt hours delivered, and I'm already at 86%, so that was pretty quick. In the beginning, the car jumped to about 60 kilowatts and maintained it for a while because it was delivering about one kilowatt hour for every minute. Also remember how I raved about the software and the instrument cluster graphics? Well, it's lovely that I get the percentage and mileage, but during charging I would really like to see charging power, and there is nowhere to find it in this car. So even in the main screen I was playing with this while I was waiting. You've got this EV menu, which shows you the power flow with immediate motor consumption and the consumption for the climate control. Now we are pulling 2 kilowatts to keep the cabin nice and warm, but there is nowhere to find the immediate charging power. Another thing which is mildly annoying is that the mirrors don't seem to dip when you go into reverse. I tried playing about with the mirror settings on the door, I went into the menu and there is nothing to suggest that the car can do that. And speaking of the software, I've been driving the car for a couple of hours and I've already experienced some little glitches. Nothing serious, but it's a little bit odd. For example, when I was driving and the sun set, the screen was already in dark mode, but for some reason decided to switch the map preview into bright white, so it was quite blinding. But now it's back to how it should be at night in dark mode. Every time I start the car, it seems like it's confused about which units it's using for the speed limit information. And now it's saying that the speed limit is 43 miles per hour. Once you start driving and it reads the first road sign, it all starts working properly. And yeah, those CarPlay connectivity issues, but that could be something to do with my phone. The good news is that while I was playing with the software and the menus, I found a software update tab within the settings and the car can download software updates over Wi-Fi. Now, I'm going to make an educated guess and say that this is only for the infotainment, but given pretty much all of these bugs are related just to the infotainment and not the drivetrain itself, nothing unexpected happened there, the battery is charging fine, air conditioning working as it should, this could really help improve the situation. So I'm going to try to remember to connect the car to our office Wi-Fi when I get back to make sure that there are no pending updates. Whilst I was talking to you, I'm already at 90%. There are no other cars waiting, so I haven't inconvenienced anyone, but it's definitely time to go. The last thing I want to demonstrate on video is the voice control. I've never used it, so let's see whether it works. Navigate to 48 Raymouth Road, London. 48 Raymouth Road, London. Do you want to start guidance? Yes. Navigation started to 48 Raymouth Road, London. Beautiful. Third time lucky. So let's unplug and time to get going. Made it back with over 40% left in the batteries, so I could have easily saved about 15 minutes at the charging stop, but it is what it is. The consumption has settled at about 3.3 miles per kilowatt hour, which considering the temperature outside and how I was testing the acceleration and overall speed, I would say it's quite good. 
Having said that, I will have to recalculate the average speed because it kept on counting even while the car was on, or the heating was on, and it was plugged in. So it now says something like 30 miles per hour. So I will put up on the screen what the total corrected stats for the journey are. And yeah, a couple of last concluding thoughts about the car itself. This was a good opportunity to test out the seat comfort. And for me personally, at least, they worked very, very well. They are quite firm, both on the base and the kind of lumbar support, but it feels like a memory foam. So it kind of contours to your body shape. And considering even though I spent many hours in the car, I feel like I could have sat in it way, way longer. So that's good. The infotainment I've covered, but now that's actually a good point. Let's connect it to our Wi-Fi. So that is connected. What do I do next? While they're doing its thing, and I don't know whether it will actually do anything, I can show you the back seats. So, to get into the back, this is strictly a three door. In some markets, you can get a three plus one door, which I think is quite a funky concept, where you get one door on one side and a pair of freestyle doors on the other side, a bit like the i3. But those are not available in the UK, so this is how you get into the back. And there is just about enough space for a child, I would say. That seat is in my driving position and I would struggle to fit behind myself. I'm not even going to attempt to do that because there's simply not enough leg room. It's not all bad though, because we have got isofix points on both rear seats and on the front seat as well. And as you can see on this version, the rear ones do fold. I believe it's part of an optional upgrade package. If I walk around, I can actually show you the boot. So because of the convertible rooftop, all of this can slide down. So the boot opening starts here, standard boot release, and that's what you get. So a smaller boot opening than on a normal hatchback, but for the size, quite spacious, split folding seats. This is a bag with the public type two cable. And underneath here, under the fourth floor, there is a granny charger. And I just realized I haven't actually shown you the roof open, so we can't finish the video without that. Here on the ceiling you've got two buttons, so this one retracts the roof back. And if I push it once... It goes this far back, so you essentially get kind of a sunroof situation going on, but the back stays up, including the rear glass. And now if I press again, that folds back and you've got a completely open top. And that's how it looks from the back with the fabric folded. And yes, there is a small wind deflector on the leading edge. And in fact, we've got a nice setup with these three competitors. So the Fiat and that's the Mini Cooper SC, so the fully electric Mini and the BMW i3, now out of production, but a very popular car and we still absolutely love it. Feel free to let us know which one out of the three you would go for and leave a comment whether you would like to see a full comparison video between the three. Because even though you may say one is clearly better than the other, I wouldn't say that's the case. Each one is good in their own ways. And of course, every car has its own set of compromises. My first assumption was that, oh, why would you buy something like the Fiat with the very limited rear legroom when you can get an i3 for similar money and I've done many long road trips with my friends in mine. Well, the answer is that the Fiat is actually almost 40 centimeters shorter. I need to look up how the Mini stacks in, in comparison in terms of the length and wheelbase, but the Fiat is certainly the most city car out of all these examples. I think that's about it. Thank you very much for watching. If you already own one, let us know about any tips you know. I've already discovered the hidden cup holder. And yeah, see you in the next one.